I'm Rob Huckman. I'm the faculty co-chair of the Healthcare Initiative. I've had the pleasure of I think, meeting many of you over the last year and last several years. Um, and it's great to see all of you out here today. I just want to very quickly um, issue thanks from, from the Healthcare Initiative here. We are one of the co-sponsors of the event, but we are really um, um, next to the students who have organized this event, um, working with them. And it's been our pleasure to host, uh, or at least co-host, uh, this series with you throughout the year on faculty perspectives in healthcare. Today we have our last session, uh, which is with Michael Porter, um, someone who really needs no introduction around here, but um, that's not going to keep us from doing that. Um, so we're going to have a, a quick introduction by Emily and Z, and then we're going to move right into Professor Porter's uh, remarks. Thanks. Well, thank you all for coming today. It's a great honor to introduce Professor Michael Porter. Professor Porter is the leading authority on competitive strategy and is generally recognized as the father of the modern strategy field. If you've ever taken an MBA strategy course, you'll most likely associate Professor Porter with his five forces. In addition to his contributions to the business world, Professor Porter serves as a university, a prof university professor, which is the highest professional recognition that can be awarded to a Harvard faculty member. He is the author of 18 books and over 20, 125 articles. We're fortunate that since 2001, Professor Porter has uh, devoted tremendous uh, attention to competition in the healthcare system with a focus on improving the healthcare delivery system. Uh, he has influenced thinking and practice, not only in the United States, but a numerous number of other countries by developing a new framework for understanding just how to deliver, uh, how to transform the value delivered by healthcare systems. In 2007, Professor Porter's book, Redefining Healthcare, received the James A. Hamilton Award for outsta most outstanding healthcare book of the year. Without further ado, Professor Michael Porter. Well, it's a, thank you for that kind introduction, and, uh, and Rob, uh, thank you for leading our healthcare initiative, which we're very proud of, and uh, it's really been a tremendous uh, joy for me to see how the school has been able to have a very important impact on the healthcare system uh, now that we've really focused on it. And, uh, I think we have tremendous opportunity, and I hope the fact that there's uh, quite a few of you here today suggests that uh, many of us, with the kind of training that we get here, uh, will understand that we have uh, a perspective and a set of skills that are profoundly important in healthcare. Uh, indeed, um, and I, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, I think in healthcare, medical science is not the constraint. We have a lot of medical science. It's getting better very rapidly. We're, we're learning new things all the time. We're able to treat conditions we could never treat before. Uh, medical science can always get better. We should keep, keep doing it. But the real constraint in healthcare actually is management, organization, measurement, things like that. And when I start saying those words, then hopefully all of you see that, you know, what we, the kind of perspectives that we have here at HBS bring a lot to those issues. Uh, but the trouble is uh, that there are high barriers to entry. In, in order to apply management thinking to healthcare, you have to have a deep understanding of healthcare because it's, it really is different. It's very complex. This is one of the most complex service delivery uh, 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 challenges that I've ever experienced working in you know countless industries. So, um, and, and so uh, the early um, application of management thinking to healthcare was really about the margin. It was about how to do more sophisticated coding so you could get higher bills. You know, it was it was, and in fact, management has a bad name in healthcare because so much of what managers did was hassle the clinicians or game the system. Uh, but now I think we're starting to understand that if we actually apply our management thinking and our management insights to healthcare, but we really focus on, on, on the actual core of the system, which is the delivery of care itself, that we actually have quite a bit to con uh, contribute. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is talk a little bit about a way of thinking about healthcare delivery. 
Um, uh, you are going to recognize a lot of the core ideas here, or ideas that uh, for, for folk, us here at HBS, these ideas seem uh, sort of straightforward in a way, uh, but they are uh, revolutionary uh, in the healthcare system. Uh, and they are very exciting because they give uh, clinicians and provider organizations in particular uh, really a whole new way of doing what they do uh, better. Uh, and uh, as we'll see in a minute, uh, that is going to be very important uh, to avoid some very, very ugly uh, outcomes that could happen uh, if we really don't uh, uh, rethink uh, really how we do things. So uh, let's, let's begin, and uh, I have here, as, as usual, uh, a slide deck. Uh, 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 this slide deck is posted, it'll be posted on the website, uh, my site, and at the Institute. Uh, you can get these slides. Uh, these slides, I will not cover all of them, but I wanted to provide sort of a holistic uh, view of this question of healthcare delivery. Um, uh, for those of you that are interested, I encourage you to, to dive into this work uh, more deeply, um, and, 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 and we can have an ongoing dialogue. But what, what's the problem in healthcare? Well, the fundamental problem in healthcare, I think, is only uh, recently become the focus of most of our attention. The fundamental problem of healthcare is the value delivered uh, by the delivery system. That's the fundamental problem. Now, now, yes, you can argue that prevention of, of disease is really critical, but that's, again, part of how we think about the delivery of care. Uh, and if we had a different kind of delivery system, prevention would just be part of, of how, you, how you delivered care. Uh, it would just be one of a, of a whole set of, of types of services that were provided. Uh, why is value the problem? Value is the problem because only by improving the value uh, can, we avoid, can we actually solve the problem, which is that healthcare systems are, are, are just spinning out of control all over the world. I was in the UK last week and I was in Germany last week talking to healthcare leaders. Every country has the same problem. Why do they have the problem? Because demand is going up uh, dramatically uh, as people get older, um, as the developing world uh, you know, tries to cope with uh, offering more care. Uh, Technology is getting better. There's more things we can do. There's more things we can deal with. Um, um, and unless we want to ration services, or unless we want every clinician to take a 25% pay cut, or unless we want to pay more and more and more ourselves for our health care, uh, there's only one way out of that box, and that is we have to dramatically improve the value. And value, uh, which we'll talk about a lot this afternoon, is defined as the patient health outcomes achieved relative to the amount of money spent to achieve those outcomes. Uh, that's a very simple concept for an HBS student. Value, value matters. Uh, in healthcare, it's a revolutionary concept. It's not been the way people think about delivering care. Uh, the way we, we've thought about delivering care is we've thought about access as being the critical issue. We've thought about uh, having lots of services. Volume has been really, providing a high volume of services has been sort of the way people have thought about the system. Uh, providing good equity of care so that all groups get, get care. All those issues are important, but they're ultimately secondary issues. The core issue is value. If we can achieve excellent outcomes, if we can improve those outcomes over time, if we can learn how to do that more and more efficiently, uh, then we can actually uh, solve the problem of health care. Uh, unless we do, we're only going to have uh, un unhappy, uh, uh, unhappy alternatives. So the question that's been engaging me now for, shockingly, about a decade is how do we think about the kind of healthcare delivery system that would actually maximize the value for the patient? And of course, it turns out that the current system and the way it's structured and the way it's organized and the way we measure uh, and the way we actually deliver care is anything but designed to maximize value. Um, and so the question then is, you know, how do we uh, change that? And that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Now, in order to create a high-value delivery system, uh, a system that achieves excellent outcomes more and more efficiently and improves those outcomes over time, unfortunately, we can't just make incremental improvements on the system that we have today. 
The system that we have today was, was designed, uh, sort of, and designed is too strong a word. It, it, it kind of emerged out of a legacy, out of a history uh, that reflected very different circumstances than those we have today. You know, the healthcare system, you know, right now is designed to be relatively local. It, most institutions serve, you know, really only the people living around the hospital or in that, in that, in that city. Why was that? Because, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, you know, mobility wasn't as high. Uh, you would be in the hospital for days and days and days and days and weeks and weeks because the medical, uh, the technology available to address problems, uh, you know, it, it was very different than we have today. So you wanted to be near your relatives because you were going to be in that hospital for a long time and you wanted them to come see you and, and, and there wasn't all that much that the physicians could do. A lot of it was just sort of watchful waiting and hoping that you would get better. Uh, of course, that world has changed dramatically. Today we want people to be in the hospital only a few days and even for complex surgery. Uh, we're not going to be in the hospital that long. Uh, most of the care is going to be outpatient care. Uh, but we've got a system that's designed with the inpatient as the center of the universe. And so you can see the legacy system is really not uh, aligned with value, certainly the value that we can deliver today. And if we just patch Band-Aids onto that legacy system, we're never going to get there. Um, um, and, and we've been trying these incremental improvements now for 10 or 20 or 30 years, and they're not working. So I think the, 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 hard, the hardest question here is how do we make a structural change uh, in the actual delivery system, rather than just the easy thing, which is to add a safety initiative, or introduce care pathways, or, or, or do an overlay of disease management. Uh, we, we can't do that. That's not going to work. We have to actually think much more deeply about uh, what would the ideal structure be. We need a vision for where we want to go in terms of the delivery system, and then we can't get there overnight, but at least we'll be moving in the right direction. Um, now that leads to the, 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 the kind of the third big challenge in designing a healthcare delivery system, and that is, you know, how do we change the role of competition? What should it be? What should it look like? Um, again, most of us in this room, probably as a matter of principle and certainly our kind of core values, we believe in competition. We think competition is good. We see every day competition making things better. But in healthcare, uh, that hasn't happened. You know, value improvement has been very, very slow. There's a lot of inefficiency, there's a lot of waste, there's a lot of duplication, there's a a lot of providers that don't pr produce very good outcomes. How could that be? Competition's supposed to fix that problem. Well, the, the answer to that puzzle, which is actually the puzzle that got me into this in the first place, because I'm kind of a true believer in competition, and this, this, kind, of, this kind of violated my core, core view. And, and, and the more deeply we got into it, the more we, we came to understand that the problem isn't competition, the problem is what we're competing on. And, and competition in healthcare historically, particularly in America, has been a, not, a really more of a competition to shift cost uh, and accumulate bargaining power and, and kind of create, uh, you know, uh, control the patient, if you will, rather than a competition to improve value. Uh, in healthcare today, you don't get necessarily rewarded for improving value. That's not the way you win. Uh, given the payment system, uh, given the lack of measurement and knowledge about, you know, actually the value that's being created by any given institution. So we have to also, as we re-architect the system over time, we have to change the basis of competition. And what we want in a healthcare system is we want a healthcare system where to win, every actor has to be improving value in a demonstrable way. Uh, and the question is, how do we get that kind of system uh, put in place? 
So, so let's dig into this a little bit and, and start to get, create sort of an intellectual architecture for thinking about uh, a high value delivery system and, and then we can talk a little bit about some of the examples of, of how, uh, how we're moving in this direction in various organizations in various parts of the world. Uh, every single thing I'm going to talk about this afternoon is not a theory, it's happening today. But it's not happening enough in enough organizations. And, and the question is, how can we start to accelerate the pace of, of restructuring uh, in this industry? This industry has never gone through restructuring. You know, you all study restructuring, you know, almost every day, you know, in your cases. It's sort of something we believe happens and it's not the end of the world. Uh, it's never happened in this field. And the question is, how do we get it to accelerate here? Um, and, uh, and, and perhaps we can talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Now, of course, the, the core goal of healthcare, then, uh, any delivery system has to be value, value for the patient, maximizing the value for the patient. Um, what do we mean by value? Let's be very clear. There's the outcomes, that's the numerator, uh, and then there's the cost, which is the denominator. Now, what do, we, what do we mean by an outcome? An outcome is the actual results of the care in terms of how well the patient actually does. We're actually doing a lot of so-called quality measurement in healthcare today, but we're actually almost never measuring the outcomes. The quality movement in healthcare today is primarily about process compliance. You know, are we going through some evidence-based guideline uh, in order to provide care for such and such a problem? Uh, it's kind of like the Soviet Union. You know, the, from the top down, somebody has said these are the evidence-based guidelines in the National Quality you know, Registry System or whatever the acronym is. So every provider has to follow those guidelines when they're caring for a heart attack patient or a you know, patient with XYZ problem. Uh, measuring processes is good. We, 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 we like to measure processes. All of you know that. I mean, we, we, we understand every organization has to measure its processes. But the, the, the problem in this field is we also have to measure the outcomes. Because there's a huge disconnect and gap between measuring a few processes of thousands of processes and then inferring that that's going to mean that the outcomes are good. We have to measure the outcomes directly. When we look at any given medical problem, there is more than one outcome. Uh, you know, survival is an outcome, important outcome, but it's not the only outcome. You know, a lot of patients, most patients survive. So then we have a lot of other outcomes, like, you know, how, what's the functional status of, of the patient? How soon could they get back to work? You know, what kind of hell did we put the patient through uh, in treating them? All of those things are part of the set of outcomes that matters. And that set of outcomes is going to depend on the particular medical problem uh, that an individual has. A diabetic's outcomes, the relevant outcomes for a diabetic are different uh, than the relevant outcomes for a uh, head and neck cancer patient. So we're going to have to learn how to measure those outcomes. Now, uh, as we'll see later, there is some outcome measurement in the U.S. system. We're way behind other countries, um, and, and it's a fundamental uh, challenge. If, one, if I could cause one thing to happen in America, and only one in healthcare delivery, uh, you know, it would be this. It would be we have to systematically, comprehensively measure outcomes for everything. And everybody has to do it. If we did this, many of the other things I'll talk about this afternoon would start to happen naturally. The denominator of the value equation is, of course, cost. And cost is the actual cost of providing the care, the actual cost of the resources involved in delivering the care, or providing whatever kind of care it is. And that could be preventative care, by the way. Um, what we care about is not the cost of an individual service. Uh, that's not what's really important. What's important is the total cost of all the services required to deal with Mrs. Jones's breast cancer. Uh, the, the office visit cost is interesting, but not what's really relevant. It's that total cost. Um, and the relevant cost is, 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 is the cost of dealing with a particular medical problem. Uh, and if you can compare that cost with the outcomes, then you are in the position to start to judge value. Right now, as we'll see later, 
uh, there is not a single provider organization that can measure costs that way. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about that. One of the fundamental problems that's causing our uh, value issue in, in healthcare delivery is cost accounting. Cost accounting. And of course, that's something that we all think is kind of fun. You know, we like cost accounting here. Uh, not a lot of people in the healthcare system uh, are that interested in cost accounting, and certainly the clinicians aren't. So I always have fun when we have our courses for doctors teaching doctors about cost accounting, and they actually like it. Because it starts to help them understand how they can actually think about the fundamental purpose that most people went into medicine uh, you know, to achieve, which is delivering great outcomes, but doing it efficiently enough that we can afford it. So we can help more people. So, we, so the, the kind of central goal has to be value. And we need to learn how to think about value in this broader way uh, than we most, mo mostly think about it in the field. Now, in order to drive value improvement, uh, you know, kind of, uh, we, we can either improve the numerator or we can improve the denominator. But kind of one of the central concepts in value-based healthcare is that if we have to choose which one is more important, the appropriate and correct choice is the numerator. If you really want to reduce healthcare costs, you've got to drive improving outcomes. It's only by improving outcomes, by, by, by getting the patient healthy quickly, by getting the diagnosis right, by leading to higher functional status, it's only by improving outcomes that you actually reduce cost uh, in the long run. Now, of course, we can do things more efficiently, and, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but ultimately, we can't be afraid of excellence and outcomes. We can't think that it's more expensive to deliver excellent care. Guess what? It's actually less expensive to deliver excellent care. The best organizations actually have the lowest cost in this field because they're the ones that minimize the, the, the burden of health. They, they get the patient healthy more quickly and more healthy, and they sustain that health more over time with fewer errors and complications and delays and discomfort and, 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 and relapses and, and other problems. So uh, again, in this healthcare field, there's a fear of technology. There's a fear of innovation. Because some people have got it into their heads that this is too expensive, we can't afford it. And of course, we can understand intuitively uh, that quality doesn't necessarily come at, the cost, at, at a higher cost. Uh, in some cases, for some periods of time, it does, but often it doesn't. Now, then the question is, how do we design a delivery system in order to kind of drive this value equation? And here, what we've come to understand is that there's a number of basic strategic agendas in the delivery system, and for every delivery organization, whether it be a hospital or a clinic or, or whatever it is, uh, that are kind of the, 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 the way in which we actually achieve high value. And they're kind of uh, listed on this slide. Number one, we actually have to reorganize the way we deliver care itself. Who's on the team, how they work together, uh, where they work, uh, uh, and, and, and the kind of basic concept there is that the current system is organized around the services provided. It's organized around the doctors. It's organized around the tools that we have, the radiology tools and the imaging tools and the, and the chemotherapy tools and the psychological counseling tools. And what we've got to do is we've got to change the organization. We've got to organize around the patient and the patient's problem, the patient's needs. Now again, at Harvard Business School, does that sound, you know, doesn't sound shocking, does it? Uh, but in healthcare, again, for legacy reasons, we've ended up uh, with this structure uh, of organizing really around the tools, not, not the patient. That's number one. And, and, and the same kind of concepts can be applied to primary and preventative care, and I'll mention to that briefly. Number two, if we're going to have high value, we have to learn to measure outcomes and cost for every patient in the line of care. 
That is, not in retrospective studies, not as interesting archaeological exercises looking back, but we've got to do this measurement literally continuously. The best provider organizations are now starting to do that so that they kind of know what the costs are uh, all the time as patients go through the system. They, they're tracking the outcomes as patient go, goes through the system, and they're kind of constantly looking at the value equation. Uh, and that gives them sort of critical information, not only to understand how well they did at the end of the day, but also how well they're doing in the process. So number two is measurement. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about measurement later on. Number three, uh, we have to pay differently for the care. Uh, and this, I think, almost all observers would agree on. Um, there is, uh, however, still a major disagreement about how to pay. Uh, but we don't believe there's any real disagreement. There shouldn't be any, because there really only is one way to pay that makes sense from a value perspective. And that is we have to pay for the whole bundle of services required to deal with the patient's medical problem. Uh, if in the case of a diabetic, that's a chronic condition. So a diabetic, we should get a certain amount of money to care for a diabetic with a certain risk profile for a year. Uh, if we have a uh, uh, you know, total, uh, somebody with severe arthritis that needs a total joint replacement, we should get a, a, a price to provide that joint replacement, uh, you know, starting with the initial visits and the evaluation and going all the way to the end of rehabilitation. Uh, we got to pay one price. What does that do? That aligns, really, uh, the payment with how you deliver value. You don't deliver value, the surgeon doesn't deliver value alone. You can have a great operation for that hip replacement, but you know, if you don't do the recovery well, and if you don't do the rehab well, uh, you can completely nullify everything the surgeon did. Uh, we can't pay for the surgery anymore. The only way we can deliver value is we've got to pay for the whole, the whole cycle, what we call the cycle of care. And we right now don't have the information, uh, partly because we have no clue of what the real costs are, we don't have the information to do that, but it's happening. It's happening very rapidly. This is spreading uh, around the world very rapidly. It's going to come. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about what some of the competing ideas are and, and why I certainly don't believe they, they make the same amount of sense. Um, uh, so number three is reimbursement. Number four is tying the parts of delivery systems uh, together. Today in healthcare, most hospitals sort of see themselves as standalone organizations serving their community. And, uh, and even if hospitals are part of the same hospital system, they still think that way. Uh, here in, in Boston, we have this colossus called Partners. And Partners has uh, Mass General, and the Brigham, and the Faulkner, and Newton Wellesley, uh, and others that I'm forgetting. Each of those organizations sees itself as a standalone, full service organization. You can go to Brigham and Women's Hospital and get primary care. You can go to Brigham and Women's Hospital and get kind of routine uh, outpatient rehabilitation. Uh, and, and, and that simply doesn't make any sense from a value perspective. We need to get the right care in the right facility for the right problem. Uh, we, can't you know, we can't duplicate services in, in, in every facility. We've got to learn how to integrate these delivery systems, even if they're owned by different people. Even if the rehab is separate from the hospital, we need to start getting the rehab people and the hospital people connected uh, to, and starting to think jointly about value, because value is not about any one service. Value is about the whole set of services uh, that you provide. Uh, and by and large, the system is, is completely flubbing this. Uh, when you can go to a world-class quaternary hospital and get routine services, you can tell right away we're not organized to maximize value. We're, and by the way, the, the, the amount of resources that are being wasted in the healthcare system 
uh, not by fraud you know, and stuff like that, but by stuff like this, which everyone thinks is routine and normal, is epic. And we can talk about that a little bit later on. Number five, we've got to break down the local nature of healthcare delivery. We can no longer have every you know, region have its own different hospitals, each trying to reinvent the wheel. It's a very mom and pop industry. You know, even the biggest healthcare delivery organization in America is, you know, probably less than 1% or even 0.5% or 0.1%, you know, of the industry. Uh, um, we've got to get our excellent providers that are really great at doing cancer care or orthopedic care, we've got to get them spreading their footprint across geography. Uh, so that people living, you know, in uh, rural uh, Arkansas can get Cleveland Clinic quality cardiology care, rather than whatever the little local hospital was able to figure out, you know, uh, mom and pop, you know, reinventing the wheel, without the right technology, without the right expertise, without the right services, you know, uh, uh, we've got to break down that that localization. We want care to be provided near where we are, in general, other things being equal. We'd like to have the care close by. Uh, but we don't necessarily want that close by care managed by a little local organization that only operates this one community hospital. Uh, we, we would like to have our local hospital managed by a world-class entity that is really, really uh, high value in terms of dealing with whatever medical problems they're, they're trying to deal with. Uh, and the system, by and large, is not set up that way. Uh, the final agenda is around the information technology. Uh, there's been a lot said about IT and healthcare. It is a really big deal. Uh, uh, to do all of these other things that I've been talking about, we need to have the right IT platform. Because if we're going to integrate care across the care cycle, if we're going to uh, you know, kind of maximally get teams working together in different ways. If we're going to better connect the patient to the process, a lot of the things we have to do, we're, we're going to need the right kind of IT platform. We're, we're moving now quite rapidly in that direction. The best providers, I think, are probably 70% of the way uh, towards the right kind of IT platforms. Most are not. Uh, but we're moving, but, but this is going to ultimately be, be crucial. But what we're not doing, what we don't want to do, is we don't want to just automate the way we deliver care today. That would not be good. Um, and uh, and, and that, 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 of course, is the risk, that if you start something too early before you actually change the basic structure and processes that you want to use, you end up, uh, your IT investment turns out to be counterproductive in some cases. These six kind of fundamental steps are really the key to transforming healthcare and dramatically improving the value. Not a little, not a little, uh, but a huge amount. The problem of healthcare delivery is absolutely solvable. It requires no Nobel Prize, it requires no act of God, it requires no uh, you know, incredible rocket science. It's getting these six things done. Uh, and the problem in getting these things done is this is really different <laughs> than the way things are done today. And people in healthcare delivery, and clinicians in particular, are conservative, and we want them to be conservative. We don't want them to just, you know, kind of jump off and try the latest fad. Uh, I believe that the healthcare delivery system can only change bottoms up. As individual organizations kind of embrace and understand these concepts. Uh, top down, it will be very helpful. Certain things are very helpful. And we can talk about those briefly a little bit later. Um, and the other thing that's helpful is pressure. And what's good right now in the healthcare system in America is there's a lot of pressure on the system. People are really nervous about what's going to happen, whether they'll have a role, uh, you know, people are, are starting to do budgets now for 25% cost cuts in, in major hospitals. Uh, and and, and we, what we can experience and feel right now is an unfreezing, which hopefully that will allow us to kind of get many of these things done and, and get them done relatively quickly. This is the agenda. So let me just take a, a minute and go through some of the highlights of a few of these areas just to kind of lock into what you're, 
you're thinking here, what I'm talking about. And then, um, and then we can talk a little bit about what government could do and, and perhaps other actors could do uh, uh, to make this all happen. The, really, the core question and the core issue uh, is the organizational model for delivery of care. Uh, this is an example of migraine care. Uh, uh, migraine is a you know, relatively, it's not a rare condition. Quite a few people have migraines. Uh, uh, otherwise, healthy people you know, have migraines. Uh, but it's a very debilitating uh, medical condition. Uh, it can you know, knock people completely out. You know, they have to miss work for days and days. They have to go to the emergency room. Uh, the, if their disease is not controlled, they, they, they have a tendency to want to go back to the doctor and help me, help me, help me. Um, and so migraine is, is, is a case that you know, I think is not a hugely complex uh, in terms of to understand a, a medical problem. Uh, but I think it's a great illustration of the or fundamental organizational challenge that we have. Uh, we have a case study that we uh, teach in our value-based healthcare uh, uh, workshops on uh, migraine care in Germany. And I, I show this example today because what we found is that although the insurance system is very different in various parts of the world, the delivery issues are very similar. Uh, the German delivery system, the way German hospitals work, the way clinicians, you know, organize themselves is very similar to the way we do it here. Even though Germany has nirvana from an insurance point of view. They have a wonderful insurance system. Everybody's covered, you know, premiums are based on your income, you know, there's no adjustment for pre-existing conditions. Uh, if you happen to be, have been sick, that, that, does, that doesn't mean you have to pay more. Uh, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have free choice. Uh, you can go anywhere you want. You don't have to get a referral. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a great insurance system. But they have some severe value problems, just like we do. Uh, and that's because of the, of the kind of organization of, of care delivery itself. Uh, the traditional model is organized around services and uh, specialties. A typical German would enter the system in, 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 in a primary care uh, physician. Uh, that person, he or she, would do their best uh, you know, to help them, uh, provide you know, perhaps a medication, you know, some advice. Uh, uh, if that worked, uh, terrific. Uh, if it didn't, though, that patient would start a journey uh, uh, you know, through this process uh, of care. Uh, what is the nature of the existing process? Number one, it's a sequential process. You do basically one thing at a time, punctuated by waits, delays. Uh, in contrast you know, to a parallel process, where you're doing multiple things together. Uh, number two, this process involves multiple separate administrative interactions. Each trip to each bubble, and by the way, a patient might go here, 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 over the course of, you know, a year or two years. Each interaction with a bubble requires a separate phone call, a separate scheduling process, a separate trip to a separate waiting room, a separate clipboard that you have to fill out. So there's a lot of administrative complexity here. The administrative complexity in healthcare is not the fault of the insurance companies. The administrative complexity in healthcare is a function of this way we've organized care, where each bubble is separate and today sends a separate bill, where each interaction is separate. Even if it's in the same, literally the same hospital building, it's separate. You go to a different place. Even if everybody's owned by the same organization, it's, it's, it's all separate today. Uh, the third thing about this process is it involves a lot of coordination that's very hard to do. <laughs> because these people are not working together, uh, if they want to coordinate, they have to go through a lot of effort. Now, of course, in medicine, we write, you write notes, you know, clinical notes, and notes get passed around. Uh, but those notes are, you know, very, very, uh, you know, in inadequate in terms of kind of getting that whole sense for what this patient's overall situation is from different points of view. Uh, and very hard for the people involved in this system to actually coordinate and come up with any shared insight into what the problem is and what needs to be done. Um, 
Now, uh, and, and the uh, final thing I would say about this structure here is that to the extent that this is a team at all, and it's not a real team because people are not working together, but to the extent that it's a team at all, it's what you might call a pickup team. The, the, the particular people here that you interact with are, shall we say, almost random. They have no particular necessary connection with your problem. You know, you could go to a PCP and that PCP may actually be interested in migraine and have had a bunch of migraine patients and really have a fair amount of expertise in migraine and know that there's like eight kinds of triptans, which are the, the kind of drug that's the, usually the drug of choice and up to date on, you know, which of those triptans, you know, works for which kind of case. But the chances are the PCP won't be particularly interested in migraine or particularly up to date. And the PCP you get to won't be the one that's up to date. <laughs> Necessarily, it might be, you have one chance out of, you know, X, uh, but only a chance out of X. Uh, then you might get sent to a neurologist if, if the if PCP doesn't, uh, isn't successful in, in controlling the disease or helping the patient do that. Uh, they might refer the patient to an outpatient neurologist, but that neurologist is also seeing stroke patients, MS patients. Uh, all, neurology is a very complex field. There are lots of different diseases and conditions involved. And the neurologist tends to think that his job or her job is to handle all those conditions. So, who, so they'll have a stroke patient in one visit, and then the next patient will be a, a, a headache patient, the next patient will be a cystic fibrosis or something like that. And, 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 and that's, that's the way the system is organized. Uh, does that neurologist, is that neurologist have a deep interest in, in migraine? You know, have they really studied this disease? Have they cared for a lot of patients over time? You know, maybe, but not necessarily. So this, this system is actually strangely bad at getting the patient to the providers that really understand their problem. Their problem. Now, let me say something I want to I, I be absolutely clear on. The problem is not that physicians are not hardworking or, or, and nurses and other clinicians. The people here work really, really hard. It's not that the people are not smart and skilled and well-trained. Uh, it's remarkable, and thank God for all of us, that the people in healthcare delivery, uh, pretty much in all around the world, are very so smart and very uh, dedicated and very well-trained. That's not the problem. The problem is we've put our clinicians in a structure in which they can't deliver value. No matter how hard they work, no matter how many hours they're on call, it's impossible. So we got to change the structure. What's the change? We have to organize not around the tools or the services, we have to organize around the patient's problem. If a primary care physician can't address a migraine, what the Germans created was something called the West German Headache Center. They're, they're now West German Headache Center all over Germany. Uh, and you would then be sent to this place. And inside this place was all the expertise that you likely needed to deal with this medical problem. Uh, so you'd have your neurologist there, but you'd also have the, uh, you know, your physical therapist because that has... Uh, 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 can help uh, control and manage the disease, you psychological counseling. Um, and the, the, you, what ha would happen is you would go to this organization, you deal with one scheduling pro problem, and then basically you'd parallel process. So you'd go for a day or two days, you'd go through a structured process of evaluation and diagnosis and group therapy and and, and counseling from educators about what you could do and you know, what strategies to use to control your disease. Does that seem obvious that that would work better? If you actually had a migraine than the system we have today? Well, of course it's obvious. Uh, but uh, again, we've, this, in this field, we have the fundamental flaw that we is, is something in business that we, that we just think as, take as a given, and that is you organize around the customer and their needs. If we do that, we have dramatic improvements in value. 
Uh, to the extent that this organization, which is an outpatient organization, really needs other uh, help, like an image, a head scan, or an inpatient stay to detoxify, uh, to the extent that they need other, other, other support, uh, they build affiliations. So you just don't get sent to the random place to have your, your, your MRI. You get sent to an affiliated place that is a real uh, kind of high volume MRI for head scans, you know, place. Where there's a professional relationship between the headache center and the imaging center and they interact back and forth and they share information very well and there's a very rapid cycle time in, in terms of, of, of that kind of care and, and so on. What happened in Germany when this change was made? The outcomes just went off the chart. The, the, the proportion of patients with their disease control, the lost days of work, uh, the trips to the doctor, the trips to the emergency room just essentially went to zero. Why? Because you had a group of experts working as a multidisciplinary team to actually deal with that problem in the most sophisticated way. And these people spent, you know, tw uh, you know five days a week, you know, ten hours a day working on migraine patients. Um, the cost initially went up because this model stretches out the cost. You know, you pay for your PCP visit, and then you wait for a month or six weeks and see if things get better and you're suffering but you don't want to go back to the doctor too soon and you're hoping things will get better. Eventually you, you, you know, say, oh my God, I'm not getting better. So then you end up going back to this person and this person and, and the costs are kind of stretched out over time. What this model does is pulls cost up front but because the, they are able to achieve such better outcomes uh, after not very long, you, the lines cross. You, uh, this initially was more expensive, but eight months after this started, the average cost of a patient was lower than it was before for the conventional therapy. And at, at this moment, they're running about 25% lower. So we have much better outcomes. Uh, we have 25% lower cost in the healthcare system, plus we don't have those days off of work and all those other costs for society. This is the fundamental organizational change that has to happen. We've got to organize around patient problems. Now, in the case of a defined disease, uh, that's pretty clear. A diabetic, a breast cancer patient, a, uh, you know, a, a, a arthritic patient that needs a, you know, a replacement of, of, their, of their hip or their knee. Uh, what about primary care? What we found in primary care is it's essentially the same problem. The current primary care structure we have today is what I like to call mission impossible. The typical primary care practice physician will have a panel of like 1,500 patients with every conceivable medical problem. There'll be some people that are completely healthy adults. There'll be other people who are dying. There'll be some people with chronic conditions. There'll be other people that are disabled. This primary care practice with this one structure, this one office, this one nurse and administrative assistant will try to provide primary care needs for that incredible heterogeneity of patients. Can't, can't do it. Can't do it while delivering value. So what we're coming to understand is the way to think about primary care is not to think of it as a monolithic service. In fact, primary care is the wrong way of thinking about it. They're really different segments of patients with very different primary and preventative care needs. And if you have a healthy adult, you'd want to staff up and have your team and your process look very different than if you had elderly disabled with multiple chronic conditions. And we're now starting to see a bit of a revolution in primary care where the best primary practices are starting to think this way. And they're starting to have teams within their practice. And this also implies that primary care practices need to get bigger. The, the single physician in the single office with a single nurse and you know, a single support staff uh, is never going to deliver high value primary care, uh, because, not because they don't work hard, not because they're not good people, not because they're well trained, but because they won't be staffed up and they won't have the right uh, way, way, actual way of delivering that care or, or the appropriate uh, expertise on their team. We've got to change the basic structure. 
um, we've got to change it around what we call medical conditions. Now, a common you know, pushback that we get uh, uh, on this idea of organizing around the patient's problem is, well, what if the patient has lots of different problems? What do we do then? And, and the answer to that is that you know, uh, a diabetic usually has lots of different problems. It's not just the endocrinology problem, it's also the renal problem, it's also the vascular problem, it's also the issue with the eyes and whatever that's called, retinopathy or something. When we define the patient's needs, we have to think not just about one narrow definition of the problem, we have to think about all the things that tend to be associated. So if you're going to have an integrated practice unit for diabetics, you're going to have renal and vascular and eye uh, expertise on the team, as well as diabetes educators to kind of help coach the patient in, in how to do the self-care. So when we think about defining medical conditions for purposes of organizing care, we have to think about it broadly. We can't think about it narrowly. And if, if virtually, if many, many uh, uh, patients with XYZ disease also have another disease, then we have to organize around both together. Uh, and, and that problem of matching or uh, the kind of deciding what the right unit is, is, is one that's now just starting to, to happen in healthcare delivery and, and, and will ultimately figure it out. There are some patients that are highly complex. You know, they have, they have cancer, they have chronic conditions, they have, uh, you know, they have dementia, um, and they may actually have to be cared for by more than one of these units, but that's going to be a lot better than having each service a separate bubble on the chart in terms of coordination. The organizational problem is, is the, really the core problem we have to solve. Uh, we've got to change the basic way in which we have organized care. Uh, we've, in healthcare, the organization structure is partly around the way doctors are trained, but it's also partly a structure that sort of views every case as different. Every patient is a unique case. Therefore, we have to let that unique process evolve. Uh, the cold hard truth is that, you know, if you have breast cancer, uh, the, 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 the nature of what you need is relatively similar. So rather than organizing around the exception, we have to organize around the rule. We have to put together the team that is capable of dealing, this, dealing and providing the services that most patients need, and then the exceptions can be traded, uh, you know, separately rather than the system we have today, which is organized like every patient is different. We've lost the, the power of volume and dedicated teams and defined processes and, and kind of rigorous measurement uh, because we've organized the way we have. That's number one. Uh, now, there's lots of other things we could talk about, you know, how to think about the cycle of care, uh, how to define the characteristics of the kind of integrated practice unit that we uh, that we want to build, uh, you know, how do we integrate mental and physical health together, which I think is another huge opportunity we have in the field. Uh, uh, there are many, many issues. Uh, but, any, but all of these uh, uh, ideas, and the more we could talk, the more I think you would see this, require a different distribution of volume in the system. Right now, the system is massively fragmented in terms of the services provided by each organization. Every organization is providing almost everything. Therefore, the volume of patients that any organization has in a particular problem tends to be small. But in order to have a dedicated team, in order to have dedicated facilities, in order to be good at measuring, in order to be efficient, uh, you need volume. So volume of patients with a given problem enables value. It doesn't guarantee value if you're if you screw up in terms of how you do it, you know, you won't deliver value, but the volume gives you the capacity to d create a high value structure. But as we see on, on this slide and many other slides that I could show you, uh, the typical provider only sees a few patients with any given problem. Therefore, they're forced to sort of organize in, in the way they are today. Uh, and that's one of the constraints. And one of the things that needs to happen in healthcare delivery is the consolidation of volume of patients with a given problem into fewer locations and fewer centers. That's starting to happen. 
uh, but, uh, but all around the world it's a problem. You see here in the case of Sweden, uh, the typical Swedish hospital sees one case a week for total knee replacement. You know, one case a week or two cases a week for uh, kidney failure. I mean, if you're seeing two cases a week, you'll never deliver value. Uh, because you'll never be able to have the right team and the right expertise to really uh, provide excellent care and, and do it efficiently. You'll have massive underutilized capacity, massive duplication of assets and equipment, which is what we have today uh, in the healthcare delivery system. Okay, measurement. We've already talked about the fundamental change in measurement on the outcome side, which is to move from processes to actual outcomes. In order to measure outcomes, we have to understand that there's a hierarchy of outcomes for any given medical problem uh, or for any segment uh, uh, for primary or preventative care. Uh, and again, I won't go through this concept, but basically uh, 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 the, the, we, we've really not had a systematic way of thinking about the set of outcomes uh, that need to be measured for any, any given problem. And, and now we're starting to un understand that. Uh, this is an example of, of, of what you'd want to measure if you were treating head and neck cancer patients. Um, you you want to measure whether the, the patients survived uh, and for how long, and that's by and large all that's been measured in, in cancer care because it was sort of part of the SEER system. Uh, but you also want to measure you know, things like, you know, did the patient, you know, was the patient able to speak? In head and neck cancer, there's a lot of risk that you'll lose your voice given the kind of surgery and care that's necessary. Uh, you know, was, was the patient able to eat normally? There's a lot of risk of swallowing issues that mean you have to have a feeding tube. Uh, uh, maintenance of facial uh, appearance. There's tremendous risk of disfigurement uh, for a variety of reasons uh, uh, it, with, with this disease. Uh, uh, you you want to measure uh, how long it takes to achieve remission. Uh, and, and, and to get back into, the, in, into normal life. Uh, you, uh, time, time is an outcome for the patient. The shorter, the better. Uh, you want to measure you know, the complications and the fatigue and the depression and the anxiety that are required in the care process, uh, and so on and so on and so on. And obviously, when we're measuring outcomes, we have to adjust for risk, but we're learning how to do that. We're learning how to do that. Uh, the primary purpose of, of measuring outcomes is really to inform clinicians on how to improve. Uh, but, and we're losing the power of that uh, in healthcare by and large today. Uh, where we measure outcomes, remarkable things happen. This is uh, one of the few areas in America where we measure outcomes everywhere. Every day, everywhere, every patient. And that's in organ transplantation. This example is actually kidney transplantation. Uh, there's, part of, there's mandatory measurement as part of the national organ system. Uh, if you get an organ or you want to get an organ, you have to measure every patient that's transplanted. Uh, and what you see here is uh, one of the measures, things that are measuring one year graft survival. If you got a new kidney, did it, was it still functioning after a year? Uh, you know, highly important outcome. They measure a bunch of other outcomes as well. Uh, and this is the first data set that became available from looking at the, uh, from, from that reporting system. And you can see there are 219 you know, kidney transplant programs in this period of time in the United States. And this is how they did on this particular measure. Uh, there's a risk adjustment al algorithm that allows some providers to be uh, you know, deemed as better than expected in terms of their outcomes. Those are the red dots. There's some, uh, and some providers are deemed to be worse uh, than expected given their patient mix. Uh, you know, those are the yellow dots. But most patients, you don't have enough statistical degrees of freedom to actually be able to demonstrably prove that they're better than you would expect, adjusting for the patient mix, the age, and you know, how sick they were, and so forth. Now, um, some people believe that since you can't statistically prove that, that, that this dot is different than that dot, you shouldn't be measuring. But of course, we all know in business, we measure lots of things where we can't do statistical tests and prove that you know, this is better than that. We measure because we want to learn. We measure because we want to know where we stand. We measure because we want to compare how we did this year to how we did the year before. 
And in healthcare, wherever we measure outcomes, that happens. What I'm going to show you now is the most recent data set on the same medical condition. And that looks like that. Look what happened. Everybody got better. Look what happened, the gap between the, the weaker providers and the stronger providers. Why did this happen? It happened because a lot of these people improved very rapidly. Why did they improve? Because they knew where they stood. And, and, and they knew who was doing well. And the diffusion of technology was rapidly, rapidly undertaken. Uh, the single most powerful lever we have in, in healthcare delivery is, is to actually systematically measure outcomes. But we also have to measure cost. Um, the basic problem in healthcare is that costs are confused with charges. <laughs> when people in healthcare say cost, what they usually mean is how much the bill was. And of course, we all know that price is not equal to cost. Um, and the costing systems in healthcare were set up around billing, not around the actual resource use involved in care. So uh, as many of you, some of you may know, Professor Kaplan and I wrote a paper on applying, a kind of applying modern cost counting thinking to healthcare. Uh, and, and the answer is it's not hard to do. And it's transformational in terms of seeing the world differently. And again, I won't go through these slides uh, because uh, we don't have the time. But uh, basically what you have to do is use time-driven activity-based costing which is classically relevant to healthcare because most of the resources involved in healthcare delivery are shared resources. So you've got to figure out how much of the resource of this clinician was actually consumed by this patient, how much space, how much equipment was actually consumed by that patient. And, and TDABC kind of gives you the methodology to do that. Uh, we're now starting to apply that in, in maybe a dozen different healthcare delivery organizations. It's going to spread very rapidly. And there's lots of things that you can do better uh, if you do that. Let me just cover one more topic and then, and then we have to stop. And that's the question of, of pricing. How do we pay? Um, again, as I said before, the fundamental uh, shift that has to happen is we can't pay for individual services anymore. That doesn't work. That's actually a disincentive for value. It's a disincentive for innovation. Um, we also, we believe, we shouldn't pay global capitation as well. The idea that we would pay a delivery organization one amount of money and that would require them to take care of any conceivable problem that you might have, we think completely decouples the payment from the value that the delivery organization can actually control. Uh, 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 what we need to do is we need to align the payment with value in ways that the delivery organization can actually control. And that's to pay the delivery organization around the care of the problem the patient actually has. But not the individual services, the really total package of services. And that's the, what we call the, the, the bundled uh, reimbursement. Now, a bundled reimbursement looks something like this. Uh, this is the county of Stockholm. Everybody that gets a hip or knee replacement in the county of Stockholm today and for the last few years has been paid uh, all those people's providers have been paid a bundled price, a single price covering all the things in the yellow box. There's not separate fees for all these services. They're, they're, you get one amount of money, and then the provider can decide, where do I spend this money? You know, what should I do that would help me deliver the best outcomes uh, the most efficiently? Um, and... Um, uh, the number that usually gets the attention of all my friends, you know, the, in, the, in the clinical space is the actual price of the bundle, 8,000 U.S. dollars. Now, you all are too young, most of you, to have had a hip or knee replacement, so you would have no way of knowing, but here in the United States, it would be 30 to 35,000 dollars. And these organizations are making money. Now, we've started now to get at the underlying uh, reasons for these huge differences. Part of it is in the United States, we choose to pay more for drugs and implants than any place else in the world. I, I don't quite know why we Americans should be subsidizing everybody else in the world and paying more for these things, but we do, so that's part of it. Um, 
uh, nurses and doctors actually get paid a little bit better here in America than they do in Sweden or Germany. Um, and, you know, that's neither here nor there. I mean, people should get paid as much as they can, I guess, and, and earn. But, and we have no way of allocate, deciding whether the value is there, so we've just paid based on you know, historical algorithms. You know. Uh, you know, certain specialties get paid more than others. You know, who knows whether that makes any sense. Um, but what we found is that the real reason we have 30,000 in the U.S. and 8,000 in Sweden is the use of the resources in providing the care. And, and in Sweden, they're just a lot better and more efficient in using the resources and not doing things that they don't need to do and doing the things they do better so that they have fewer complications and problems and delays. And, 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 and so I think a, a case like this tells you that we can solve this problem of healthcare. It's not an insurmountable problem. If people in Sweden, which is not a cheap place to do anything, can do a total joint replacement for $8,000, and, and, and the provider can make money, and all the people in the system can get paid you know, fairly. You know, that's telling us that there's a lot of opportunity here to dramatically improve value. And by the way, they get just as good a, uh, outcomes as we do here in America, at our best hospitals. Uh, so basically, I think the message I want to leave you with is, you know, the core issue in healthcare is actually the way we organize the delivery of care. Uh, the central guiding principle that has to be true north in every choice we make about that needs to be value for the patient. If we think about value for the patient, that leads us to a set of other choices and implications having to do with our organization, our measurement, our pricing, uh, the way we connect across entities in the system, uh, and the way we mobilize IT that I think are all doable, they're all actionable, and they're all happening in one organization or another. The challenge is how do we accelerate this transformation? And uh, that's, a, that's an issue that Rob Huckman and I and many of my colleagues here you know, think about every day. Uh, I personally believe that government right now isn't being very helpful. Uh, so therefore, uh, I've chosen to f focus primarily on bottoms-up change by engaging with the provider communities and hospital systems around the world. Um, uh, but health policy can have a big impact as well. Uh, for example, we need mandatory outcome measurement. We need new cost accounting standards. Uh, uh, you know, we need various uh, changes in the payment system. Uh, so government can help, but, but the good news here is that every provider organization, without anything else having to happen, will benefit uh, in doing its job if it can start to embrace these principles. And, and so I'm very hopeful uh, about this pro uh, this, the, the, the ability to solve this problem. I'm very optimistic about the potential, uh, but uh, it's going to take a lot of change in organization and things that all of us in this room understand well. Uh, we know that there's always resistance to that and discomfort with that, but I think slowly but surely that's going to change. So that's a point of view. Um, again, we, we're, 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 our time is over. Uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions afterwards here because uh, I don't want to hold this whole group, uh, but I'm so pleased that you uh, came. I, 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 it's a great honor that you all came. Uh, hopefully this gives you a, a way of, of, of thinking that will allow you to sleep better tonight, uh, I hope. Uh, and I hope a lot of you go into healthcare delivery system because there's rampant opportunities in doing all these things to, to create enormous positive impact on society and, and, and also make, make a lot of money if you're uh, providing some of the technology and services involved. Okay, so thank you very much.